Afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Schleusner. Uh, I'm a director of design technology research. Um, the research is in quotes there at uh, HOK, which is an architecture firm. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about pretty much non-visualization uses of game engines and things we're starting to think about. Really trying to help, if you will, Unreal and others figure out what we can do with a game engine, all the other stuff that exists besides just the making pre pretty pictures stuff. Uh, so I'm going to be over here afterwards if you want to ask me questions, but it takes, takes about 15 minutes. If you bear with me, hopefully you enjoy it. Thanks. So a little bit about HOK. Uh, we're an international architecture firm. We work in pretty much uh, every market you can think of, save maybe industrial, I think is the only one that we don't do. But anything from labs to sports facilities uh, all over the world, uh, you know, Korea, Chicago, uh, somewhere in the Middle East, I can't remember, and Seattle, uh, Atlanta, you get the picture. We do a lot of stuff all over the world. And so fundamentally, we're looking at using gaming engines for a lot of stuff, namely visualization. These are all real photos, not any visualization. I'm trying not to actually show you any visualization today that looks good, and trust me, you'll see some stuff that looks bad. Uh, so we use HOK today uh, or excuse me, we use Unreal today at HOK for visualization, uh, mainly by experts, but we certainly use Twinmotion, and that's our front door to it, and we're certainly excited to see where that goes in the future. We build configurators for a few things. Uh, we're certainly using Datasmith, and then we're exploring the use of merging those things together, photogrammetry mesh, point clouds, and that sort of stuff, and Unreal being a good place to put that all together to tell a complete story about, it, in some words, an asset. Uh, and we're doing experiments on how to make an, a game that we can easily update, because that's one of the challenges we have. Uh, so uh, MPC walks into an office. Raise your hands, how many people know what an MPC is? And so if you don't raise your hand, an MPC is a non-player character. Just imagine if you've ever seen a game, if you're controlling the character, that's not an MPC. Anything else that's coming at you that's not someone else on the other side of the world is a non-player character. And so fundamentally, it's technology that allows a game to simulate behavior or enact behavior behind the scenes that's baked into the game. So the simplest one is, I don't know, you walk up to a box on the, and it's got some loot in it. You touch it, and it opens up. Stuff like that is AI behavior, and the box has a little behavior that you interact with. So our interest is looking at using that to study uh, architecture and thinking about the uses of it. So fundamentally, uh, we're using an office for this discussion because everybody works somewhere and hopefully that's the case. But if you don't work in a large office space, you've heard people talking about the different studies about how these places are great to work in or not great to work in. But fundamentally, what they do today, and it's a good example, I can just walk out here. Like if you have a, a, a area of open office, what you often have is these collaboration space and you can see they're sprinkled all over the pl a plan like this and fundamentally that means there's a, a mix of areas to do certain kind of work perfectly easy to understand so I mentioned this uh, around the non-player characters the things we're looking at are looking at the, the capabilities behind behavior trees uh, environmental query systems there's a lot of acronyms in this world uh, and then the other methods and I'll talk about those a little bit later but so the good example of this kind of problem is one that I think everybody's experienced, and that's why we're using it as a good example. So here's my desk. It presumably has an outside of the building, which I have a window. You can imagine it's a good seat. But there's this guy, which is basically the guy that's loud on the phone all the time. Maybe he doesn't know it. Maybe he just doesn't care. And fundamentally, what, what people often would do if this is continuous and they need to get something done is they would search out and find that space pretty easy problem. Every understands if it's too loud, you go somewhere else to get your work done. Well, fundamentally, this is a decision tree of sorts. And so basically, if you're judging it's too loud, you make a choice. And uh, if you go to the space you first go to, and it's not available, you go to the second one. It's a very sort of meaningful understanding, or an easy thing to understand in a practical sense. And the key thing about this is it's not it's not something that you're trying to simulate. It's actually just decisions, if A, then B. Not, you know, you don't have to understand all the whole of human behavior to simulate this sort of idea. 
So the problem, obviously, is what happens if this is your world and everyone does this. So here's my really bad visualization. I intentionally made it garish so you wouldn't uh, anticipate that it would look good. But fundamentally, what you're looking at is a scenario like this. Like in my little stupid demo, there's the place everybody wants to go. Everybody in the office hates this guy and they go there. Again, I'm over-exaggerating the problem, or exaggerating, I don't know if you can over-exaggerate, but fundamentally the idea is can you build a behavior, sorry, that, that mimics either a guy that's too loud or someone that talks too much on the phone. Maybe this is on a corner that's perfect, but in the morning it gets way too much sun and you can't get your work done, so there's a glare, but somewhere over here controls the blinds. All of these things that are uh, the consequences of a design, can we actually look to study those? So, in, you know, like I said, very silly explanations, here's a bunch of people walking. All this is, is uh, the game starts, and this guy emits a sound, and as soon as the sound is emit, they go somewhere else. Dead simple to understand, but you, the, the, the point is to illustrate the idea and think through the variations of this theme. Uh, Trust me, I don't do this for a living. This is me experimenting, and that's why it looks so bad, but I have to explain it away somehow. So we're looking at it as a complementary process. So you see a lot of world, the action in the world right now in the architectural space around generative design or computational approaches to making a thing. You see uh, um, processes by which people analytically study the space, but they often don't analytically stu study the way people will use the space. So you can imagine a scenario like this, like if I have all the knobs that we want to react, you could agree on the terms, like, okay, 20% of the people uh, would react to this much noise to go somewhere else. And if you come up with a matrix, you could come up with a, uh, a basically a process that you could judge all kinds of different scenarios. Imagine going home, af over, going home at night, over the night, you run a bunch of versions of those scenarios, and you basically just get an understanding of where your building or design fails the most in these sort of interaction modes. So that's just sort of the things we're starting to look at. But fundamentally, it's this idea of trying to test a design in a complementary way against the human use versus just the analytical, you know, sort of stick built of the parts of the building. So fundamentally, there's different kinds of non-player characters. I mentioned the loot box example. Obviously, the person that talks too loud is a non-player character, but anything could be a non-player character. So a good example would be, what if we put a tall building across the street and all of a sudden my views are gone is a kind of you know, non-player because it wouldn't be interacted by you. It'd be something that gets introduced. My favorite one today is this one which is something you can buy. So if you go online and find this Travelmate Robotics Company, for $1,200, you can buy a suitcase that will follow you around. So this is a great idea, but you can imagine the chaos that would ensue at an airport if everybody had one of these stupid things that everybody would be tripping out of them. So it's the idea that you can you know, sort of inj inject these ideas into a design process to see, well, what would actually happen. And again, it's not a simulation, it's really just a decision process, like if we overload it and you know the flow rates, what happens in that scenario. So in testing these things, some of the work we're doing is trying to understand how we can do this quickly, because doing it is interesting, being able to not, not uh, spend 10 hours to do one study is really the goal. So the things we're looking at right now are trying to take advantage of stuff that's in early beta, this is a good example of um, one of the data prep workflows that's actually in 4.22 that will be updated, I think, in 4.23. But basically the idea that when you import, import assets through a Datasmith importer, you can basically, you know, uh, what do we got here? Replace the, uh, set the little LOD for things, substitute materials, because maybe you don't care about them. Uh, you can make simple collisions, so you can generate a nav mesh that actually functions. And, uh, and then uh, the one I have highlighted there that we're not doing, you can certainly do this with blueprints yet, is sort of instantiate a person for every chair of a certain type, those sort of activities where you can you know, sort of add a person to every desk, as example. And again, this will change, but this is an example of some of the tooling that's being built to support these sort of ideas. Uh, obviously, they're coming from a visualization side, but you get the idea. Then simple stuff around, like, where is a... Where is the uh, 
NPC is supposed to go. Like right now, I'm just hard coding in to set the idea that, that the game started, they go there. But obviously, there's a series of choice. I do that, kept doing that. If, you know, if I want to do heads down quiet work and I'm an engineer, I want to search out a certain kind of space versus if I'm, you know, trying to have a meeting with another person and just have a conversation, that's a different space. So you need to involve these sort of choices in the logic of building these things. And from there, this is the dumbest behavior tree you ever see. It's basically the technology that exists to start to build these things. This is one of the technologies. So basically, you start a sequence, and I'm waiting two seconds for this guy to, uh, for people to react to the noise. Uh, when they react to the noise, they'll move, and then they're going to wait for 5,000 seconds, which is basically the end of the game because we don't care about anything else. We're just, you know, sort of testing out where they're going. You could never do a, an actual behavior tree this simple and actually get real data out of it, but it's just an example of the technologies that exist to start to, uh, to look at these things. And then I mentioned nav mesh. That's fundamentally how you get an AI character to know where they can walk. You, know, you can see right now I can walk on top of these desks. Yeah, you, you pick that out right away, but fundamentally you know, we, ha we need to be able to make this process simple, give it a model, give me a nav mesh, A, B, and C, and you can go from there. And uh, obviously, um, there's certainly optimizations can you do on here, but fundamentally, you get the idea. These are the, if you, if you will, the ingredients we're thinking about. So a the, the, uh, couple of things we're thinking about is there's one of the aspects, and a lot of our models like this would come from uh, BIM platforms, which fundamentally have concepts like rooms. So looking at the fact, can we use rooms to make a destination automatically? And obviously, the name of a room would help you understand its function. Like, a uh, touchdown space would be the perfect place for somebody that's visiting for the day and wants to get quiet work done. So that, that is the technique we're looking at, injecting this logic into the things. And you know, fundamentally, I'm not really certain why I put collision box on there, but that's obviously what you would be able to do is use that uh, geometry of the room to specify things about the targets. So maybe that table is the actual asset you're targeting for something you want to, like, can you get to the tables easily? Something like that. So architecture, I'm playing this game that everybody else plays. In the, the real world, everybody calls architecture either technology or what I do for a living. Uh, on the architectural side, we're actually talking about technology. So if you think about it, there's no real reason to have to look at this thing. So we're looking at uh, approaches pe people are taking in different areas, but using game, game engines for similar things. So this is Carla. I can't remember what Carla stands for, but it basically is fundamentally a lot of the autonomous dri driving companies are using game engines to feed data into their sensors. And so you can imagine they don't want to watch those things learn all day. So they come up with these ideas of you know, a hero mode or a non-rendering mode where you can see the world, but you don't have to render the frames to understand how the simulation works. The same ideas are things we should be th thinking about in our world. And then the last stuff, there we go. The last stuff we're thinking about is just the, the tools and techniques that are, are there, and there's plenty more. But uh, so EQS is an environmental query system, which is a good example, and I'll talk about it in the next slide. Is a, an example came online recently of a simple environment where you have three deer. You are one deer. There's a deer that wants to follow you, and a deer that wants to run away. The deer that wants to run away actually has to ask the environment, how do I get away from me, the character? They have to query the environment to know the furthest distance. They can't ask me, because I don't know. So that's an environmental query system. An AI perception system might be asking, can I hear something? If I make a sound, do they hear me? So those are the techniques you would start to look at to you know, see what's in engine to figure out what questions can we ask. So this is a very good uh, demo that has just been posted online, so if you're interested in looking at, this is actually Wes Ben posted this on, on the YouTube, and basically you can search for this and go through this, and this teaches you everything I just said about the deer. You know, find the deer that follows me. If you're not doing anything, wait and eat, uh, or if you're afraid of me, run away. You know, it's a very good demo of the whole system, and it gets to help you understand the things. It is a more complex uh, idea in a game engine, but it's, again, a very powerful area that starts to think about what could you actually do in an architectural sense. So that was it. Thanks, everybody. And I'll be right here if you have questions.